Hello, good morning. My name is Jessica Peterson, and I would like to welcome everyone to today's WED Talk, Managing Multiple Priorities in a Hybrid Work Environment. Before we kick off our WED Talk today, I would like to introduce the Director of Workforce and Economic Development for the County of Bucks, Billy Barnes. Thank you for joining us today, Billy. Thank you, Jessica. Good morning, everyone. I'm Billy Barnes, Executive Director of Workforce and Economic Development. On behalf of the Bucks County Workforce Development Board and the County of Bucks, I want to welcome everyone to WED Talks. This month is especially significant as it marks the first anniversary of hosting WED Talk discussions led by industry experts. Together with PA CareerLink, WED, has hosted 12 webinars and served more than 400 professionals with practical strategies across the most relevant, diverse topics affecting employers and employees. Many of these topics have centered on COVID-19 since its impacts day-to-day -day operations and has long-term consequences across industries and participating labor force. Today's web talk is no exception. Since the pandemic started, Working from home has evolved into hybrid work model aided by better technology and online tools for greater employee engagement. Even organizations whose work must be done on site have digitized processes and workflows to increase efficiencies, improve operations, and optimize output. This historic shift requires us to rethink how employees interact with the workplace and how leaders work with their employees to get work done while promoting collaboration, flexibility, and well-being. By joining our WED Talk today, you are ready to adopt actionable strategies for generating momentum on projects, accomplishing what matters most, and maintaining a work-life balance in a hybrid workplace. Let's introduce our management training expert who will lead today's discussion. Jessica? I am pleased to introduce our WED Talk presenter, Eric Papp. Eric is the founder of Agape Leadership, an intellectual, intellectual capital firm focusing on leadership for business performance with the sole purpose of driving leaders and their teams to success. He is known to deliver proven strategies to increase productivity and performance in a complex world by helping audiences clarify their thinking on what's most important. A renowned public speaker since 2010, Eric has been selected as one of the top management trainers in North America for his expertise in leadership effectiveness. His books, Leadership by Choice and Three Values of Being an Effective Person are top sellers and recognized for their impact on the business world. During today's presentation, Eric may be asking questions. If you can utilize the chat feature to put your answers in, and then Eric will also be taking questions um, throughout the presentation you're welcome to ask those questions in the question feature. So welcome, Eric, and thank you for leading our discussion today. Awesome. Hey, thank you, Jessica, Andrea, Billy, Deanna, everybody that went involved behind the scenes to making this possible. Thank you very much. My name is Eric Papp, coming to you live from Tampa, Florida. I'm excited to be here with you today, Wednesday, June 8th. And just a little fun fact, fun fact, my mom, born and raised in Bethlehem, PA, and my dad, uh, born and raised in Trenton, New Jersey. And so when I was looking at Bucks County on the map, I was like, wow, that's like right at the north and right at the south there. Um, and I, I, I lived, we lived in Harrisburg a little bit um, when I was back probably in the first grade or so. And so when I say water, people say, how do you say water? And, and it's, so they know that that's a reference, I believe, to Pennsylvania. I, I, that's what people have told me. So, all right, well, I'm excited to be with you. Hey, how about we start off today um, making it about you. And I want you to put in the chat box, what's the one thing that's on your mind right now that you want to gain momentum, you want to create a little bit of velocity? Um, what's the maybe one project? It could be something personal or professional. Either way, I, and my intention is this, is that by the end of our limited time that we have here, that you're going to gain clarity and you're going to get greater insight into that particular area. So, just take a take a couple seconds right now and put in the chat box what's something, one area, a project or something that you really want to, you know, get a higher level of effectiveness. So go ahead and put that in the chat box. Let's 
custom. And so as people start to do that, um, put their that project in there, we're going to go ahead and get started. One of the first things um, in our environment that we're in, in a hybrid environment, right, is make it easy on yourself to stay focused. So how do you do that? Well, one of the things is when you're working at home in your laptop and you've got it there, is be mindful of how many windows you have open. I've noticed it's something simple, but something that really is impactful. A lot of times we have like 10, 15, 20 windows open. And so if you can get in the habit of having like the rule of three, no more than three, it's gonna help you stay focused and stay disciplined. So that's a key thing. So when you have a lot of windows open, oftentimes it's like windows in our brain as well. And so we're trying to, our, our attention is getting scattered. So if you can really try to condense it down to three, it's very impactful for your focus, all right? Um, so let's go ahead and lock in and let's go ahead and start with a little story here. How many of you have an Apple product, right? You have either maybe an iPad, an iPhone, um, you know, uh, whatever. You have some sort of Apple product. How many of you out there have that, All right? If I had to guess, it'd probably be 80%, you know? This is interesting here. This was on the, if you look here, the February 1996 edition of Business Week, the fall of an American icon. And it's kind of hard to believe, right? Because a lot of us just know Apple from their incredible success. I mean, at one time, they were the most successful, profitable company in, in the world. Um, and I mean, just all the innovations that they've come out of. So it's like, how did this How did this happen? And how did they go from here to here? Well, it was very interesting. It's very applicable today in managing multiple priorities in a hybrid environment and applying better thinking versus more effort. So let me share with you how they got this little case study here on a macro example. And then the importance of that and the lessons that you can learn and you can apply in your own life, both personally and professionally. How they got here is they, Steve Jobs was, you know, he got fired, he had, he had to leave his own company. They brought in a guy, CEO from Pepsi, and they started doing everything. This Apple started making scanners, they started making printers, they started making 17, 17 different types of desktop computers. They were doing so many projects. So they had their hand in anything and everything but they really weren't making any, you know, long-term headway in any one direction. And so they were, they were really failing. In 1997, when the board had asked Steve Jobs to come back and they really wanted him to come back and take control, they were, Apple was losing like $1.04 billion. When he came back, he says, I'll come back, but I demand that we do a lot less projects. And it was very applicable to him, he, you know, to do a lot less because, a neighbor asked him, they said, Steve, you know, you've got a lot of different types of desktop computers. Which one should I buy for my family? And he says, I can't answer that question. And he said, oh, man, if I'm the CEO, going to be the CEO, and I can't answer that question, we've got a real problem. So he came back, he took all these projects they were doing and really condensed it down, locked it down to 10. And so within a year, they went from losing $1.04 billion to gaining a net profit of $398 million in 1998, his first year as CEO. And then you think about what happened then after that? Oh, they had the iPod, you know, and then, and then the iMac came out. And that was that, that computer that was like a blue, you could get in different colors and completely just shifted um, just the way we interact with technology and how it's in our lives. And so, and, and, and like many of us, right, we now have, you know, some form of Apple product probably in, in our house, it made it very user friendly. So what's the lesson here? I mean, here's the key lesson, and you can apply this right out of the gate um, in your own life. And your capacity to think of new projects will always exceed your ability to execute successfully. It's very key. Your capacity to think of new projects and to say yes and, oh, I can do that. And yes, I'll be there will always exceed your ability to execute successfully. We're going to talk later on about trade-offs and that when you say yes to something, you're automatically saying no to about 50 other things. And oftentimes it's invisible. So I talk about, you know, we're gonna talk about the invisible trade-offs. So what you give your time and attention to throughout the day, it's very key. You have to kind of really be in on that because and also that affects our mindset. We're gonna talk about that as well in terms of to increase our level of effectiveness. So that's one of the things I wanted to share with you right out of the gate. Also too, this whole topic, right? Why is this so important? Well, this is important, you know, not only from a, a micro, but also on a macro level, you know, how do you increase gross domestic, gross domestic product GDP every year? Well, it's two things, it's population and it's productivity. And so really this is productivity. How can we apply better thinking versus more effort? You know, how can we move three projects a mile rather than a hundred things an inch? And so that's the key thing is identifying 
what's going to be impactful, what's going to be valuable. And that's a shift for some of us, right? Because sometimes we view our time, we view work as like time and effort. Okay, how many, how many hours did I work last week? Okay, oh, last week I worked really hard. I, you know, I spent 70 hours at work. Okay, or I didn't, you know, so it's like we think of like sometimes work as is through this lens of like time and effort. I want you to shift, start to have that shift of it's not so much time and effort, but it's value and impact. What's the value and the impact of your work? Okay. Now, a little bit about me, my history. Um, that's my pops right there. How did I get in the whole, whole learning and development? It really started at, at a young age. Um, you know, my dad would take me to these speaker conferences. And I would hear these speakers like Les Brown, Zig Ziglar, you know, listen to these tapes in the car of Anthony Robbins, all these guys. And I thought, wow, this could really help me in whatever profession I choose to, to go into, whether it's maybe something in coaching, athletics, or maybe it's something in the business world. And so that kind of really got me going. And then since then, I've just really kind of kept on that path. And I linked up with a seminar company called Skill Path Seminars. I was the number one ranked trainer there in 2009 when I left. Um, I also, a little fun fact, taught the FBI speed reading. I'm a big believer in that the more that you read, the more that you're developing your mind and your computer up here, so the better that you can make decisions. So it's, you know, your memory, everything. And then um, also a little something about me is we welcomed our second child into the world uh, two weeks ago, Cole Alexander. So that's him. So that's just a little bit about me and uh, my journey. Oh, and my formal education, people like to ask this, my formal education came from the University of Notre Dame. But my self-education is just, it's constantly ongoing. All right, so let's take a look at this. What's the undisciplined, you know, what's the challenge here, right, that we're tasked with, that we're faced with every day? And that is this, the undisciplined pursuit of more. Where we're saying yes to projects, you know, and sometimes, you know, depending upon your level, director level, VP level, you know, and you're working with other people, we get execution happy. Where we get an idea and then we immediately want to execute on it. And we don't take the time to stop and say, wait a minute, let's think through this. You know, where does this where does this fit in with all the other projects that we're pursuing? And what happens is we don't take that time to pause and reflect. Just right here, we have progress that plateaus. We become overworked. We become overwhelmed. We become overcommitted. And, you know, and then it goes back to what I said earlier is we are doing a lot more than we can successfully execute. So that's really one of the biggest things is that then the myth out there is, oh, you can do it all. You know, no, we, we can't do it all. We have to acknowledge where we want to see the greatest level of impact and then really having the self-discipline of saying not right now we're going to look at that later but these are the these are the two projects i'm going to work on you know for this quarter all right so really having that self-discipline approach another thing too is a lot of times how many of you have you seen this message before right you've seen this message before you got to take a picture perhaps you know it's like oh man storage almost full i share this with you because it's a great analogy it's like our minds and your mind is not meant for holding a to-do list or, or storing all your items. Your mind is meant for generating solutions for ideas. One of the most valuable things that I carry with me throughout my day in my pocket, it's not my phone, it's what? It's a little notepad here. So when I get an idea, when I have a conversation with somebody, moment of inspiration, I write it down. Just yesterday, I was in Daytona Beach talking to executives, um, the Florida RV Park and Association. And just, you know, so I'm there giving a keynote speaking presentation. But then when I meet people, someone might say something, oh, hey, you know, have you thought? And then boom, I write it down. So writing things down, getting things out of your head helps you compute and helps you free up the space. Think of it like as your head is like a computer. And the more that you can empty your head, the faster your computer will run. Okay. Conversely, if you're carrying everything in your head, what happens? Just like on a computer on your phone or on your, you know, on your work desk, the more that you have in there, the slower it goes. So that's the same thing like our minds. So I want you to really be mindful of that because I want you to get in the habit of just writing things down, making a list, getting it out of your head and onto a sheet of paper. Not necessarily that you have to then execute everything that you do on a piece of paper, but at least it gets it out of your head. And then your mind can kind of think through and process that, okay, is that something that we're going to do? Is that something we're going to delegate? Or is that something that was just was, you know, was just a thought? A lot of times we have like these thoughts going off all the time. It's like, you know, when you're looking at, you pour a bottle of Coke or champagne or whatever, I don't know, whatever you drink, you see all the bubbles. That's like all of our thoughts and, you know, they're just constantly going off. So the more that we can get those out of our head, we start to get some clarity when we write them down. And, and then also too, like I said, is your mind is meant for generating ideas, solutions. 
when you give yourself the space, the mental bandwidth, what you'll notice is, is you'll get some a great idea. And you probably already had this happen to you before, right? You'll be in the shower, your mind will be relaxed, and then boom, you'll get an idea at work, or you'll get an idea for something, you know, uh, family, you know, um, thing. Or you'll be walking the dog, going for a nice walk, relaxed, and then boom, you'll get an idea. And that's, that's, that's perfect. That's when you want to do what? Write it down. And you get usually those ideas because your mind is relaxed, so your mind can operate at a higher level. All right. So what else is one of the challenges here that we're dealing with, you know, especially nowadays is sometimes the imbalance of what's important, right? It's very easy that now we've got this hybrid environment that even though you're, you know, you're working from home and you're going to the office for one or two days, you know, or started to, is sometimes being at home, we can even actually work longer. And so sometimes that there, there can be that imbalance there. So we need to just be mindful of that, you know, this imbalance where success in one area comes at the expense of another. And, and, and so realizing that, and, and, and look, I have, I'm in the same situation. I've got a two and a half year old, I've got a two week year old and, um, you know, and being able to shut it off, right. When I've, when I'm doing things from home and then being with them. And, and one of the things that, that's helped me is realize is that, okay. Um, and I read this study or a report or case study, you know, it was something like, you know, with your kids, it's like 93% of your time that you spend with your kids will be, you know, up until the age of 18. And then once they hit 18, you know, you only spend like 7% in terms of with them. So I look at that like a reverse, like, wow, I only have so many more Saturdays, I only have so many more weekends. So I look at it like, whereas okay, so if I have that time with my daughter and we're out, we're out back, we're playing in the pool or I'm pushing on the swing, like I'm trying to give her my full attention. My, my phone is up or it's away. Now it doesn't always happen. Okay. But that's really, I try to be mindful of that because it's like, I'm never going to get this back again. And that's kind of the, my approach to that. So that way it just helps me be a little bit more present. I'm not saying it's the right way. I'm just saying it's, 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 it's helped me be more, you know, be more present in, in those things, areas of my life. Um, <laughs> we often default to more effort, right? When we're going through something at work or a project, and that can be maybe okay for the short span, but we really want to apply better thinking. You're here today. This is very key, right? Managing multiple priorities in this hybrid environment. This is all about better thinking, better thinking versus more effort. Better thinking, just as the example that we gave earlier, the Steve Jobs one, is better thinking is him coming in and saying, okay, wait a minute, we're doing 400 some projects. You know, we've got 17 different types of desktop computers. Better thinking is be able to step back and to subtract. So one of the key things that better thinking starts with is to, to look, to analyze, and, and to subtract. And subtract and focus go hand in hand. Because you, you come to realization that, okay, I can't do everything at the level of success that I want to. So what do you have to do? I have to take a step back and I have to subtract. I have to say no to this, no to this. And sometimes that that can be hard. Absolutely, it can be hard. I mean, do you think when, when jobs went back, like when people are making the Apple scan or the Apple printer, do you think that they were excited to hear that, hey, we're no longer going to do that? No, they probably weren't. But in the long run, look what it was able to, to help the company. I mean, the company would have gone out of business if, they're, if they just continued that path. They were like four months from bankruptcy and you know, they lost $1.04 billion. So that's the, the key thing. And we'll learn also from another company, I'll share with you another case study later on, that the same thing just happened um, a couple of years ago to another company, another company that, that's very well known. So learning these, these lessons here. Now, where's the issue to um, learned helplessness? Very interesting. Martin Siegelman from the University of Pennsylvania, right, in, right where you guys are. Fun fact, my grandfather, went to Penn State University. Um, but this, ex this little study here, Learned Helplessness, was done in about 1967, Martin Siegelman, University of Pennsylvania. What they did very simply is they gave dogs a minor shock and they had three different groups, two groups of the main groups, right? So they had, they put the dogs in a harness, they'd give them a minor shock, the dogs could press a lever and that would stop the shock. So that was one group. The second group, they gave them a harness, they pressed the lever, the lever did nothing. They can still continue to receive a minor shock. So then they took them in a box and they had a little minor shock at the bottom. And then they could they could easily see, you, know, on a, you can see on the screen, they could jump to another pad where it was no shock. And so the first group that they had the harness on, they got a little shock and they could stop it themselves. Almost all of the dogs then jumped to the no shock area. But the ones, the second group, 
that they got they got the harness on, they got a minor shock, they pressed the lever, nothing happened. When they went to this experiment, they gave them a minor shock. The dogs did not jump to the other platform. They just sat there and took it. And and this is very this is this is tremendous concept because it's it happens in our own life all the time, right? Um, and that we think, oh, I can't do anything. Oh, you know, what's the use? And and a lot of this too sometimes goes with when we're not being responsible for our own mindset. If we're watching a lot of news, we're watching a lot of what the media is. And realize too, the news and the media, the last like 10, 15 years, it's it's not really news. It's just it's meant to captivate you because they're focusing on ratings. So they're trying to they're trying to wow you. They're trying to get you to really lean in. Um, you know, because they want you to keep watching. And that's, you know, that's really what what it what it has become about. Um and that, anyway, that's a whole other subject we can get into. So we want to be very mindful, though. I want you to be mindful of what the thoughts and 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 what you put in your brain, because that also that that can play a part into our level of effectiveness. All right. Um, now I want to share with you a little video here. Let me see if I can take my audio out, switch it over. Silver audio. Okay, can you hear me? See me okay? Yes. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and play this. So this is like a learned helplessness, if you will. That's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anyone? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help now. Would somebody please do something? All right, switch back over. Did you hear that okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. Hello? Everybody yes, can, hear can hear that okay? Yes, okay, thank fantastic. you. Yeah, can hear it. Awesome. So the question then becomes, right, is what is the escalator in your life? We all have escalators that's, I mean, are you, what are the, what's the broken escalator in your life? You know, things that we we think that we're up against, that we're waiting for somebody else. We're waiting for maybe the perfect solution. And that's oftentimes what we do, right? As human beings, we're waiting to see, okay, I've got to know what all the steps are before I take action. You know, before I, before I write this book, I want to have all of my chapters, you know, I want to know exactly where, you know, we want to lay everything out. It's like sometimes just, hey, just get started. You know, just get started in that, you know, one step will lead to the next step and the next step will lead to the next step. And so just just keep moving. And so the idea is being able to to take action, because when we all have, you know, uncertainty in our lives and we realize that, OK, I can either a I can procrastinate. Right. And just think, OK, this is going to pass. Just wait it off. Or I can take action. I can just ask myself, what's the next what's the next step I can do? And that's the idea. That's what highly effective people do, right? They bridge this gap between what's important and what's actionable. You know, that's the key thing to think of is throughout my day, okay, and throughout your day, what is what is what are the three things that are most important today? And then are they actionable? 
And when you find that sweet spot, man, then, then you start to operate at higher and higher levels of effectiveness. And when you think about it, it's, it's really neat, you know, because when you look at like history and you see people like, uh, like a Leonardo da Vinci, you know, and then even today, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, Jobs or uh, Elon Musk and just, you see the, their levels of effectiveness and their levels of thought to create things. So what's important, what's actionable is to bridge that gap. All right, now I wanna do a little fun activity. I wanna get you involved here and I want to share with you something. So you have that project. Some of you had, had put that in the chat box. What's the project that you're working on? So we're going to work through this and you're going to get this at the end of the session. So this will actually be, this will come to you so you can print this out. You can also type it, but at the end of today, you'll be receiving this via email, PDF. Okay. But for our purposes, you can do this right now. You can just get out a piece of paper and we can work through this. So I'm gonna go ahead and explain it, and then I'm gonna show you an example, and then I'm gonna, we're gonna allow you some time to actually do this, because I really want you to get, like I said earlier, is get a higher level of effectiveness. I wanna get you uh, an idea that perhaps you didn't have before, and you'll get that if, if we apply the better thinking. And so here's a little process to do that. So number one is we identify the project, the project that you are working on right now. So it might be something for web design, um, it might be something professional, I mean, something personal, whatever it is. We put the project there in the top left, the top right are three bullet points. So three bullet points very simply is this, what does success look like to you? What is your desired outcome? Okay. in three bullet points. Okay. So if I'm doing a website design, I, you know, that might be my project and my three bullet points. Number one is I want clarity of message. So when people you know, it's clarity and it's clean. So when people land on our website, on our page, they know exactly what we do, how we can help them, and, you know, what, how we solve their problem. Fantastic. Number two is I want the, 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 the design to be, you know, just simple, clean, beautiful. Really, you know, the design goes into our brand and what we're trying to portray. Great. Number three is I want it to be, you know, uh, cost effective. I don't want to, you know, spend 100 grand on a website. Okay. So cost. So those are the, so that's, what that, that's like my project. And then this would be like my three desired outcomes. All right. So now when you have that, that's your top part. Then we work left to right concerns, create, commit. What are your obstacles? And this is beautiful, right? Cause the more constraints and obstacles you bring forth, the way the human mind works and just the research of your brain, the more obstacles that you bring forth and write down, what's very fascinating is your mind will start to search for ways to overcome them and answers. And, and you'll get ideas that'll pop in your brain. But you have to do your part. You have to write down all the obstacles. And that's usually the biggest part of, of why people aren't as effective as they could be is because they never acknowledge what their obstacle is. Sometimes their obstacle is just internal. It's that level of like self-worthiness. Like, oh, I don't know if I'm worthy enough. Oh, I don't believe in myself. It's lack of confidence. I had that one for a couple of years, you know, um, where it's just like, oh, well, I don't, you know, Okay, I'm, I'm, I've spoken to her at these conferences, but man, at this conference over here, you know, in front of 4,000 people, wow, am I, am I good enough? Am I worthy enough, right? That's something I had to confront. So I don't know what your obstacles would be. They could also be, you know, so it could be those internal and then external. External could be, you know, what are the resources? What's the time available? Um, do we have the expertise? You know, whatever. You can just write all those down as many as you can think of. And then, we go to the middle column. And what's fascinating too, like I said, is the way the human mind works is when you generate all the obstacles, the concerns, the constraints, the brain immediately starts to look for solutions. So in the middle column here is I want you to identify and write down as many solutions as possible. And if you catch yourself second guessing, just keep moving forward, right? I don't want you to think, oh, well, we tried that before or that didn't, no. Write down as many, many as possible, okay? And then from there, we look at your list of all the ideas and the things that you've created, the new possibilities, and we pick one or two in terms of what's your next step. And then we identify that. And then you can say, okay, I'm gonna start this. Today's June 8th, so I'm gonna start this. It'll be on Friday, June 10th, I'm gonna have a meeting with this person. Or June 9th, tomorrow, Thursday, I'm gonna do this. So your next steps is your one, two, maybe three things that you're gonna actually do to get yourself into action on this project, all right? Let me give an example. 
and then I'll in the chat box if you have any questions on this, um, let me know. And then I'm going to give you actually time to to do this. All right. So here's one that I did um, March 2020, right? March of 2020. You know, when the whole everything was when we thought the world was coming to an end, I flew, I had a plane plane trip or a, um, a speaking engagement in Las Vegas. I did that coming back on the plane, sitting next to Dick Vitale. We land. Dick Vitale informs me and the rest of the plane that, you know, they just canceled March Madness. Wow. So this was something was really, this is serious. And then, you know, within about a week, two weeks, about 80% of my personal revenue um, income is, is, is like cut. And so that, that's enough to, you know, just imagine that if you can, you know, your, your income gets cut and then you have a family of support. And so it can be a little stressful time, right? So managing stress, motivation, mindset, what did I want? I wanted to have more energy, have more happiness and worry less. That's very simple. What are your obstacles? Those are my obstacles, okay? Fear of the unknown, anxiety, when it'll be normal again, losing my patience at a faster rate, drinking too much red wine. That was my, uh, my kryptonite, if you will. So, um, all right, so to have that there, what do I want to do? Well, okay, what are, what are some ideas here? Limit consumption of media, you know, go back to morning walks, afternoon headspace. Cause I was like on the Hopkins, like tracking thing. And I'm like running analytics and like, you know, I'm like looking at graphs and, you know, channeling my inner economy, economist, you know, thought process. So it's, but it's like, that didn't do me any good. You know, I'm trying to forecast trends and it's like, Eric, you're not responsible for that. Nobody, you know, it's just adding a lot more anxiety than it is really helping. Uh, so afternoon headspace, 10 minute meditations. These are fantastic, by the way. Just, you know, if you have access to YouTube, which which I'm sure most of you do, just type in like 10 minute meditation. Um, but headspace, calm, simply being different apps you can have on your phone. Just taking a step back for five, 10 minutes and just listening to that. Whew, tremendous in terms of freeing up the anxiety and, and the space in your head. Uh, plan something to look forward to as a family. OK, and then so these are the two that I chose. Got back to going to morning walks. That was a game changer for me. Really starting the day with sunlight out, walking around. Um, really very helpful. And then planning something to look forward to as a family. Doing a little, uh, we do start to do like little family outings. You know, you just little day trips. So that's just an example of that. Let's go back here. Um, and let me pull up the, uh, the, the chat. Any questions or concerns? Let's see here. All right. Does everybody know that the chat, I mean, I see 44 people on, but I don't, I don't really see too many people in the chat box. People, no? Eric, there, um, we do have a question, a couple of questions. People have put some things in the questions feature and in the chat. The chat was oh, more okay. for your first question about your, what challenges you're facing. Okay, now I'm seeing the, now I just pulled up the question thing. So now I'm seeing personal yeah. habits, Ian, Amy, Beth, Lisa, Amy, Juliet, Jennifer. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. Okay, cool. All right, now I'm seeing that. Yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, and not related to this, there was a question. Would you like me to go ahead with the question that someone asked? Yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. One, one of the questions is, after giving people free range of scheduling their time in the office, we are now forcing mandatory three days in the office. How do we make them understand the need for this? Yeah, so one thing is to look at the impact, right? <clears throat> it's great to, to the people can be on their own and to, to have that. But one thing is to share with them the impact. And I would simply ask them like, you know, so instead of you explain that to somebody, ask them the question, why do you think you need to come to the office three days a week? So can you ask that? So I, I can I can generate a lot of responses, but I want to hear what they have to say. So I would ask that. So if someone says like, you know, now we're tasked to come back and we've got to come back, you know, three days a week, you know, why do we have to do this? I would say, why, why do you think, why do you think that that might be important? Does anybody, so at, let's ask that. Let's put that in the question box. Let's see what people say. I'm having to end the show so that way I can kind of see the responses here. All right, so I'm looking at the question box here. So when someone says that, why do you, 
you know, why do we have to come back three days in the office? Let's see what I would ask that question before I give a response, even though I, you know, I, I, I know the importance of that. Or I kind of know that, but I want to see what I just got. The chat box was yes. Ah, very good. So Marie, Marie and Ian, you're right on top. And so here's the thing, collaboration, you know, and, 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 you know, and you could say something like, wouldn't you, you know, can you agree with me or what, doesn't it make sense that sometimes when we're all working in isolation, just by ourselves, that things get, things fall through the cracks, you know, another person might say, yeah, I, I guess you're right. Yeah. Things fall through the cracks. Um, wouldn't you agree with me that when we're all working just from, from home in isolation that maybe communication gets misinterpreted. Wow. Yeah. Because we don't really, we don't really know what someone's, you know, personality perhaps because it's just all done behind a screen. Ah, oh. you know, but yeah, so that's, so you start to kind of, and, and just, you do this in a question format because some people, and I, I, I just say you kind of, you tread cautiously on this because some people are, are pretty resistant, right? And as human beings, we get, we, we, you know, when things happen um, and we now are working, working from home, people are like, that was a big shift. And then now they got used to that. And now it's like, okay, now I don't want to go back. <laughs> um, and so now it's like just kind of just treading softly in that and seeing where the resistance is. So you ask them the question, hey, why do you think it's, and then see if they say, give you some answers like, well, collaboration, um, you know, idea sharing. Yeah. And then also what I would do and ask, so if I'm a manager, director, if I have to have these conversations, I would say, hey, what is your, what is your reason? What's your number one obstacle for not wanting to come back the three days a week? I would ask this to, to, to folks as well. So I want to really identify where is their level? What's the big obstacle that's impeding on them? Right. And then we want to try to find solutions around that because they might say, um, well, I'll actually, I'll ask you guys, what's the number one reason if there's anybody out there, you know, or I mean, what they heard from their folks, but definitely ask that question. You want to get out to the heart of concern. If you can get to the heart of concern of why they don't want, then we can work and we can start to see how we can brainstorm some possible solutions. Does anybody have that? Nobody. A question. Okay. Gas prices. Yeah. Somebody sent me a thing yesterday, Ian, about gas prices. Somebody says, I'm taking out a loan. I said, what are you taking a loan for? And they said, to, to buy uh, some gas. So I thought that was interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, okay. So gas prices. Okay, that's fair. You know, anything else? And that and that could be too, right? So when someone says like a gas price, so then we we might go back and we might say, okay, how can we brainstorm um, you know, are, do we have things in the budget to, to perhaps, you know, with gas cards, you know, whether it's on a weekly or monthly, just a little, a little bit of a stipend there. I don't know. Um, you know, and really kind of seeing what that impact is. Engagement is huge. Okay. Yep. Very good, Amy. Um, what did Brett say here? Yeah, we thrive as a whole thrive as unit. Absolutely. And that's something yeah, so these are, you can kind of see this as, you know, that's the whole idea, you know, when two plus two doesn't equal four, but equals like five, six, or seven, because you have the collection and the diversity of ideas, and it's and it's tremendous, right? Um, long commute. Okay, and this is great, too. Um, so thank you, Jennifer, for saying that. So like when people say that, you know, and just ask them, so on your commute, you know, what do you think that you're missing or you know, how do you think that you could make that commute into something that would actually serve you? That'd be my question then. So yeah, that's, yeah, long commute, no, no doubt. Um, I mean, I'm not, you know, if you have to, if you're living, you know, with traffic and stuff and coming in, <clears throat> I would ask somebody that like, okay, what do you think that you're giving up? And they might say, oh, I'm giving up, uh, you know, my reading time or I'm giving up, you know, so, okay, well, how can we make your car into your, you know, your little university, you know, we can have, you know, audible and things like that. Um, so I, I really want to just get to the heart of this. So I, one is asking them the question and then asking, having that, Hey, what's your number one obstacle? And sometimes 
if I have a team of like seven or eight people, I'll probably have these conversations one on one as opposed to just a, a mass email or a mass thing, because I really want to generate the buy and I really want to get people along, you know, and when I say get people along, like get them to that, OK, I can see the importance of it. And, it, and it's, they're not going to get there overnight in some cases. Right. It's not going to be a quick conversation. No, it's going to be a slow process. But the more that that I'm empathetic as the manager, as the leader <clears throat> to seeing where people are at, the more it'll help that process. And then, you know, three months from now, six months from now, it's a no brainer. They love coming in the office. They love also the flexibility of, of being from home. I think it's just it's the best of both worlds. Right. Because when you want to take a longer weekend or you want to just knock out something at home, if you have that uh, that capability, it's tremendous. So I, I love the the best of both. Did I answer this question? Okay, or I don't want to belabor it, but also want to give value. Was this helpful to whoever? I'm just looking at the question box. Is that okay? All right. So that's that's a great question. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, guys, keep the questions coming. Um, now let's take a look at the effectiveness process. So let's go back here. Let's maximize this. And so you could actually run this if you want uh, to the project. So the project is asking people to come back uh, three days a week. So we could actually run this through this. What do you want to have as your desired result? Well, desired result is I want people to, you know, um, want to be in the office or, you know, be in the office without, without, um, you know, a, a major attitude or just, or being upset or something. Okay. That might be one of the things, you know, so you can actually use this as a, as a platform to, to generate some ideas. All right. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and work through this though. Does everybody have a project that they could work on from this? Is there any that you have some sort of pro you could do this like, you know, something at work professional or it could be something personal but i want you to have something here all right let's go ahead and work through this so let me give you just one minute identify your project and then three bullet points what does your success look like i'm going to put time on the clock here okay this is where you're going to get the most out of today is when you actually apply this strategy and you map it on to your business so i've got one minute on the clock and your time starts now. Okay. What is your project? All right. And what is three bullet points? What does success look like? And then I'm going to give you, a, and then we're going to go a minute, a minute, a minute in each of these boxes. All right. So the first thing is just this, this top part. All right. And I shared with you my example. So what is your project? What does success look like to you? What is your desired outcome? All right, I got it. That's the door. Isn't it funny how nobody answers their doorbell anymore, right? You hear your doorbell go off and you're like, what the, you know? And then you're like, you know, you look out and you're like, oh, okay, it's just, it's Amazon, you know? Whereas before, you know, growing up, we'd be like, somebody would pop over and ring your doorbell. It's like, oh, hey, how you doing? So, all right. Um, whoop, almost there. So, what are the obstacles? So, you've got your project, you've got what does success look like, all the obstacles, concerns. Go ahead and write those down. Let's take one minute. Time is on the clock. And if you have any questions regarding this, but please do those. Do this. It's a little simple, just a couple minutes, and it'll be very helpful to your success. So one minute right now, write down all your obstacles, all your constraints, things that you think is holding you back.
Okay. Now I'm, we're kind of going at this as a, as a, at a rapid pace. Obviously this is something that imagine if you did this with your teams or imagine if you just did this for 15, 20 minutes, the clarity in the organization of your thoughts would, would go up, you know, tenfold. All right. But I'm just kind of doing this um, due to the time that you're, but I want to give you a little taste of it. Now, what are your ideas for overcoming these obstacles? Let me put a minute, on the clock here and I want you to generate as many ideas as possible and your time starts meow. All right, timer off. So now let's just take another minute. So you've hopefully, you've, you've identified your project, you've identified what does success look like to you in three bullet points. You've also looked at the obstacles, the constraints, the concerns, and why this is so important is because the way your brain works, when you bring forth obstacles, constraints, and you write all those down, your brain searches for solutions. And also, if you don't write the obstacles down, what happens is it's very interesting. <clears throat> they come up later on as roadblocks and it prevents you from getting where you want to go. For example, something I think a lot of people can relate to, but is uh, if I'm looking to lose weight, right, lose an extra 10 pounds, um, if I don't write down my obstacle of chips, snacking at night after eight o'clock, you know, if I don't write that down or acknowledge that, which that is kind of my weakness, you know, I love chips, um, if I don't acknowledge that or write that down, then what happens is it's going to come up, you know, but if I write that down, I'm more apt to find ways to combat that, you know, okay, you know, what am I, you know, don't have chips in the house. Number thing, you know, second thing is, okay, well, when that does come up, you know, switch to another, switch to uh, my oatmeal that I, eat, you know, so that's kind of the idea is that you, that you're looking for ways that you can then <clears throat> be more effective, but it starts with identifying the obstacle and the concern. <clears throat> All right. Let's take one minute now and identify your next steps, the commit. What is a commit? What does that look like? Your very next steps. Today. Let's take one minute of all the ideas that you've generated and go ahead and write that down. Okay. All right. So that's the idea. That's a qu very quick way of going through this. Like I said, you can obviously spend, if you spend just 15 minutes on this, you'll get a higher level of, of ideas and they'll give you that, <clears throat> that level of momentum <clears throat> and velocity is sometimes projects that we can feel stuck on. Any questions on this or, or those that, that did it, do you see the impact or <clears throat> ideas from this? Is it helpful? Looking Eric, right. someone put in the question feature, do we fear writing obstacles because we fear that it becomes real? Ah, that, that's a great, uh, yeah, I like that. Great question. I'd say we fear obstacles because it's almost like this, um, 
<clears throat> I guess you could say it's a planning fallacy or optimism uh, bias where we are. <clears throat> so planning fallacy, it's kind of like they did a group of a study of, of university kids that were writing their uh, doctoral thesis. And they said, how many days do you think, you know, you're going to write your thesis in if everything goes according to plan and there's no hiccups of research? And most of them said like 29 days. And they said, okay, well, how many days, you know, if you have hiccups on research, things like that, you know, that, you know, that you have to maybe, how long do you think it'll take you then? And they were like, ah, 45 days. You know, most people said that. How long did it actually take them? It took a majority of the kids or the university, you know, people that are writing their doctoral thesis, like 55 days. And so a lot of times, so that, so whether you want to call that a planning fallacy or optimism bias, where we think, you know, uh, things are going to be a lot easier you know, than, than they are. Um, that's really what we run into. But I would say, no, write them down and, and just, you know, put, put the fear aside. When you don't acknowledge them, what happens is the fear becomes real because if I don't write them down, then it, it grew, then it's still in my head. <clears throat> but when I write something down, I'm much more able to tackle it, to find solutions because it's, I, I take it out of my head and I put it on paper. So now I can search for solutions. Now I can let my mind, my brain do what it does. Let your brain do what it does best. And that's generate ideas. You know, the level of, of creativity, of, of curious. Your brain makes an observation. Your brain makes connections. Um, it's phenomenal. <clears throat> okay, cool. Very helpful. Awesome. That's helpful. Okay, great. And yeah, keep the questions coming. That's great. All right, so let's let's move forward. Hey, I want to share this little story with you since you guys are, are in Pennsylvania. Does anybody know who this picture of? Um, <clears throat> this picture is. I'll give you a little little tip. My grandfather uh, worked for Bethlehem Steel for over thirty years. This gentleman was influential. Anybody know this picture of that I have here on the slide? Can you guys still see my slide deck? Yes. His university named after him. Pittsburgh. He was in the Pittsburgh area. Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie, thank you. Is that Billy? Mark. Mark, thank you, Mark. Yes. <clears throat> so Mark, Andrew Carnegie, yes. Now, why do I have a picture of Andrew Carnegie? Is this just because, you know, this is Bucks County in Pennsylvania? Perhaps. Um, but what was very interesting here, Andrew Carnegie, right? Somebody very successful, you know, accomplished a lot, you know, really helped raise the level of GDP, right, here in America, okay, uh, from an economic standpoint. I have a picture of him because he was in, in one of the Pittsburgh clubs, you know, one of the, you know, a, 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 you know, a high rise building, they were there. Um, so he was smoking cigars with other, you know, thinkers at the time. And a young consultant, you know, was there. And Andrew was, you know, kind of wanted to kind of, you know, I guess you could say maybe challenge this young consultant. He says, hey, young man, if you can tell me something that'll that'll help my business, I'll give you, I'll write you a check for $10,000. And man, I mean, people were surprised. I mean, $10,000 back then, that's like, you know, what? I don't know, maybe $200,000 now. I mean, that was a lot of money. And uh, he says, okay. He says, make a list of your most important items, your 10 most important items that you can do. And start with number one and don't go to number two until number one is complete. That's all he said. He said, make a list of your 10 most important items that you can do, things that you can do, and don't go to number two until you do number one. And then after you do number two, then you can go to number three. And it sounds so trite, it sounds so, so simple, but yet it was profound. Carnegie then, two weeks later, wrote him a check and the, the legend goes, the story goes that it was, you know, uh, Frederick Taylor um, that was there. Um, so it, it just, it's very interesting. And so what's, and it's very applicable for today, right? Make a list and stay disciplined. Make, and, and I make lists throughout the day. I shared this with you before, but this is with me at all times because like ideas will come up. Oh, I've, I got to get this for my wife, you know, things personal. Oh, I've, you know, and then uh, projects or ideas will come up. Oh, I want to, want to, you know, want to do this um, with, with my eighth grade confirmation class that I teach. I'm going to create this for them. So it's like things will pop up in our mind and we write them down. And when you write them down, it really, it helps for that because then you can able to see, to prioritize that. Okay. Now 
Another example of what we're faced with in terms of this undisciplined pursuit of more, a company that didn't know, how many of you probably have this in your container in the kitchen, uh, kitchen right? Where you've got lids and you're always looking when you put some leftovers in something, you're like, where's that leftover lid? Uh, Rubbermaid, right? I'm sure you can relate to this or you've, you've used Rubbermaid. Rubbermaid is a great example. They're a company known for their innovation, but their innovation got too much and they created over a thousand products in just three years. And so what happened is when they were just innovating, creating, creating, creating like crazy is they lost focus of what was basically, what was important. What's important in business is customer service, okay? And, you know, not spending more that you, than you earn, your cost, keeping your cost. And so they lost focus of all that. They had to sell. Um, and so it's just, it's another example of the undisciplined pursuit of more when we're trying to do way too many things and we're lacking the focus to, uh, to really identify and the focus to say no um, to all the projects. So what are the 10 most important things you can do? It's great to just ask yourself this on a weekly basis. So just to kind of keep this top of mind. So it keeps this top of mind for you. What are the 10 most important things Now you can do? Now notice I say important things. Remember the previous slide too, we said important plus actionable. So it's finding that sweet spot. That's where you want to execute. Important plus actionable. All right. Another strategy I want to share with you as we wrap this up is this win. What's important now? This sits on my desktop. If I was there in person with you, I'd, well, I'd give you a high five, a handshake, or a hug. But I'd also... Uh, win. What's important now? I, this sits on my laptop here, and I think this is tremendous because throughout the day, I'm constantly asking myself, win. What's important now? What's important now? Okay, what's important now is I'm prepping for this. I'm doing this. Okay, what's important now is I'm getting ready to go, or you're getting ready to go into a Zoom meeting later on. Okay, you know, what do you need to do to prepare for this to have a, success, a successful Zoom call? Okay, what's important now is you're wrapping up your day. So you want to plan for tomorrow, you know, uh, your next day. So constantly asking yourself, what's important now? It helps you win throughout the day. It helps you win the morning, the afternoon, and the evening, okay? When you have that mindset of what's important now. Now, a little story of that or a little kind of to go into that. Does anybody know who this is a picture of? I don't expect you to know this. This gentleman is a, a gentleman from Utah named Larry Gelwick. He's a former rugby coach. Um, 20 national championships, you can see here, an astounding record of 418 wins, 10 losses. His motto for his players was very simply, win. What's important now? And he tells, he tells, he says, hey, we didn't have the biggest players, we didn't have the fastest players, but that was our motto. And it really kept players, what, focused on the present moment. So if somebody made a bad um, uh, move or if the ref made a bad call, he just helped regain his focus, his players focus on the present moment. And so that they could be fully immersed in the present moment and then also make better decisions that help serve them win. what's important now. All right. That's a picture of my daughter, Ellie. Let's put her in the, in the picture there. Last concept I want to share with you is identify the trade-offs. Also, if I was with you in person, I would hand this to you too. Identify trade-offs. This is so important. A lot of times these are invisible. Like I say, invisible trade-offs. If you are saying yes to something, you're automatically saying no to something else. So when someone says, hey, you know, can you do this? Can you sit on this board? Hey, we need you over here. Um, just be mindful. Just be more attuned to what you're giving your yes to. So if I'm saying yes to this, that means I'm probably saying no to like 50 other different things. So that's why this is so important is a lot of times we're just saying yes blindly thinking, being delusional that, oh, we can do it all. Um, and then that's how we get the overwhelmed overwork because we just put so much on our plate then we can successfully execute. So that's the idea. And then what determines your result, right? Throughout the day, what do you give your attention to? It's very simply, what books do you read? What do you consume? You know, do you consume a lot of media or do you consume some good books? Perhaps maybe some Audible if you spend some time in the car, some great podcasts. Very, very important because there's two types of worlds out there. There's a world of concern, which is concern, compete, comparison. And you'll know comparison. If you ever spend more than 20 minutes on a social media platform, you'll notice you feel better about yourself or worse. Usually it's you feel worse because your confidence takes a hit because what happens is we subtly, subconsciously compare ourselves to other people. And so that's the whole world of concern. The world of control is what can you control? What can you create today? How can you contribute in the lives of other people? 
that's the idea. And so that's something to be very mindful of. And, and what's very cool is when we focus on what you can control, what books you can read, what you can create, um, ideas, you know, then that circle starts to expand. And so what you can, can control starts to expand. All right. Any questions as we wrap this up? How has this has this been helpful for folks? If you can put that, and, and please make sure you thank all those people involved, Andrea, um, Diana, um, Billy, Mark, Jesse, everybody else that, that really helped put this on. This is how I plan my day. And uh, I, th I think we'll be talking about, oh, I'll get with Andrea to see if, if, if everybody will be getting a, a copy of this. But this is just another tool to have in your, your toolkit there, you know, what, what this looks like. So. Thank Excellent. you, Eric. Um, people are asking if they can get a copy of the presentation. I believe that will be sent uh, out. Jess, Jessica, uh, did you want to have wrap up comments? I'm sure, yes. I will be sending out the presentation to everybody that attended today. Um, I also wanted to remind everyone to please save the date for our next web talk on Wednesday, July 13th, entitled Changing I Quit to I Fit Five Powerful Strategies to Increase Employee Retention and Create an Amazing Workplace Culture. Our featured expert will be Heather Younger, CEO of Employee Fanatic and a contributor to the leading news outlets. Heather will discuss ways to develop a caring leadership style that builds a culture of belonging and inspires loyalty and retention. Registration for this web talk will be arriving through email soon. I also wanted to say thank you so much, Eric. It was extremely informative. It was a great presentation. Um, I'd like to see if there's any last minute questions or comments from anybody that's on the call. I think we're all set, Jessica. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of leave you with, can I leave everybody with three things? Sure. May you have gratitude for your past. May you find the joy in these uncertain times. Right now, find the joy in your present and have hope for your future. My name is Eric Papp. If I can ever help or serve you, you know, you connect with me on LinkedIn. I put articles out there. Just just drop me a line, eric at ericpapp.com. And um, all the best to you, to everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone.